Okay, this is a short talk. Uh, and it's about achieving uh, love wisdom through the cultivation of the five Ds. Intriguing, perhaps. Uh, discipline, dispassion, discrimination, decentralization, and detachment. Sound like fun? Okay. So let's take a look at these necessary uh, eliminations. Plus there's four more that are found in raves and initiations before we can really uh, clear the way for uh, the inflow of the kinds of energies we want. We have to get out, out of our own ways. So let's take a look um, one, at a, one at a time, okay? I know you're familiar with these, it's just the doing of them, that's the hard part. So notice that when we take the word discipline, it's a very generic term. It's found in the word uh, disciple. Uh, it's almost entirely included there. So what comes to your mind when you think of, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of discipline? Very good, okay. <laughs> now, how, how exactly do we exercise discipline, you know? Um, obviously, these words have a lot of uh, flow over each other and they, they don't particularly apply to only one place in your energy system, some of them more so than others, but uh, this term discipline can be applied to all the vehicles and the personality and everything, really. But let's apply it physically and uh, not let the uh, etheric physical elemental close down the more sensitive psyche. You know, it's a, an outer thing and we have to do the right thing uh, externally so that the good thing internally can occur. So this is a real, you know, there's a weight, there's a very Saturnian kind of thing that happens. It's a weight upon us. Um, <clears throat> but if we get that straight, we want to all be open to the possibilities of the uh, inner life. And, you know, uh, uh, Moria said that, uh, you know, when have you ever become less through sacrifice? He might have well have said, when have you ever become less through discipline? Every disciple, and we're, you know, presumably all trying to be that, has to go through this process of getting out of their own way, you know? Okay, so let's apply this to the etheric physical fundamental and uh, goodness, I'm Freudian being all over the place. <laughs> elemental, <laughs> a funda fundamental elemental. Okay, okay. So now, um, dispassion. This, of course, seems to have more to do with the astral vehicle. What comes to your mind when you think of dispassion? What, perhaps a Ray 2 astral body instead of a Ray 6 astral body? How many admit to a Ray 6 astral body? Okay, keep working. <laughs> so, um, how do we exercise this passion? Uh, we, in a way, we do not desire what is transient and what is found in the world of phenomena. We get all worked up about evanescent things, transient things. Uh, the Buddha would have us avoid that kind of attitude. And I think we'll be hearing a lot about the four, uh, four noble truths in this respect. So we'll be taking the Buddha's advice. Uh, his teaching on dispassion was powerful. And really, DK said uh, he, he came very much with his six-ray mind to uh, uh, conquer the factor of misdirected desire in humanity. So, you know, measure your desire nature, what's it oriented towards, and what are the adhesions which have to be removed because we probably all have them or we wouldn't be here right now. Okay, the next is another D, discrimination. This is a more mental factor in a way. So think of it just for a moment, discrimination. Uh, 
I think a term, you know, viveka, uh, Sanskrit term, is applied here because we have very much to exercise it in an important way around the fourth initiation. Interestingly, it's not just an early thing. So uh, how, how do we exercise this in our lives? Are we discriminative? It's almost a word that uh, has acquired a negative connotation, but as occultists in training, we have to have it. It's, um, we're separating this from that, you know, with discrimination. It's, a, it's an act of separation for clarification, an act of separation for clarification. So um, what's being mentally separated in your life so you can tell what they really are distinct from each other. And um, we look at where that's found on the Tibetan's charts, and it's found just on the border of the uh, concrete mind and the higher um, mental plane. Uh, and it helps us really determine, and it's not easy to do, what is of the personality and what is of the soul. We use the words all the time, but you know, what really is of the personality and what really is of the soul. And uh, in, a, in a higher sense, if you look at the fourth initiation, it gives you planetary rulers for all of those things. It's Mercury and Saturn, which are found at the fourth degree where you are, are really discriminating uh, cosmically from the dense physical body of our planetary logos and his cosmic etheric body. And you know, things are alive on the cosmic etheric body and in the dense levels, it's just the realm of effects the lower 18 or 21 subplanes. So we try to discriminate that. We try to discriminate that from this in the old Vedanta terms, right? That is the one reality, seamless, homogeneous, indivisible. And this is whatever perception of the multitude of perceptions crosses our mind. Discriminating that from this. Discrimination works all the way up will have to discriminate, I mean, it's just going to keep going, okay? Even up to the ninth initiation and who knows beyond. So, you know, there's the form and the relatively formless and there's the cosmic astral plane from the cosmic physical plane and all those things that are beyond us, but discrimination will be at work. So do we discriminate clearly enough and do we use Saturn and Mercury in such a way that we can really tell the difference between what's alive and what's not quite so alive. The, the dense physical body of our planetary God is, not, is a realm of effects, and yet we treat it as if it's reality, and it's not, and we have to discriminate accordingly, okay? So it's a mental thing, mental intuitive, and it goes all the way up. <clears throat> okay, here's another D for us. Love those Ds, you know, it's the fourth. You know, these mnemonics, DK uses them all the time. They, they are a number of uh, words that start with the same letter, so you can group them together and really remember. You know, and that, I think that's, that's really important, to remember series of descriptors which reveal to us a process which is necessary. So the next one is decentralization. Decentralization. So what comes to your mind when you think of decentralization? And how do we exercise that, you know? We all have a, um, a range of consciousness we all have a field of consciousness. And um, so often the great unreality, which is the personal ego, is in the middle of it all, you know. I can never get out of my mind that Master Moria calls the ego a ball of fat. <laughs> it kind of puts things in the proper place, you know. So it's about getting off the center of our own stage and uh, there are other things to concentrate upon uh, within this ring-pass-knot of consciousness. And really, whatever 
this false identity, which is a very limited thing, has to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink until it just disappears, and then we will become what's called in Leo language, the relinquished point. And then in our field of consciousness, there will be reality and not the false identity. So, uh, you know, the little self has to shrink. And uh, that's called decentralization, getting off the center of your own stage. Uh, the, the Tibetan said to one of his disciples, never for one minute do you forget yourself. Well, there's self-forgetfulness, and then there's self-remembering. There's a larger self to remember, while a little self is being forgotten. But if we struggle so hard to forget the little self, we're doing the little self thing. So we have to have a passionate interest in that which is not the little self. So uh, maybe a preoccupation with the divine plan would help, and with the fate of humanity. And then the question is, are we thus preoccupied? Or are we always preoccupied with our little self? You know, it takes a little while to grow out of that, doesn't it? You know, if we can talk only about ourselves and how we feel and how things are impacting us and us and us. And, and meanwhile, the whole world is on fire. So what's important and what's our priorities? Decentralization, that's the fourth thing. That's what the personality has to be subjected to. So, so far what I've got here is discipline for the physical body, though it's a broad term, dispassion for the astral body, discrimination for the mental body, and decentralization for the personality. Then there is uh, the big word, detachment, and that just applies across the board, and that's one of the Buddha's big terms. So what comes to your mind when you think of uh, detachment? It sounds good if I could hear it. It's like a letting go of everything, freeing yourself. Letting go, you know, that's a good word. I, I, I once studied Zen only to discover it wasn't my path. Something about being hit on the, hit on the head with a stick, you know, I, and not thinking. I, I know, I, I, <laughs> oh, you're thinking again, are you? Oh, we'll take care of you. No, okay. You know, for us Ray three types, <laughs> it may not be the way. <laughs> but anyway, letting go was the big word. Let go, let go. But what is it that's letting go? And what's being let go of? So it's a change of identification. You can't be detached unless you change your identification. I just did something to my screen, but I'm detached from it. OK. So it's almost as if it's happening to someone else, you know, and that someone else is what we thought we were. And we, we pre sinned as they say. We stand back, we stand back. and. Uh, you know, I, I recognize my other self, and in the waning of that self, I grow and glow. It's the Gemini, Gemini thing. The self divides. Of course, eventually, the rejected self becomes the reclaimed self, right? You never reject anything, ultimately, just temporarily for expeditious purposes. So it is the uh, scientific approach recommended by Dr. Asagioli. You know, you look on at the customary self, as if it was someone else, you know, and you look at it scientifically. So it's the observing consciousness. But what point of observation do you take? You know, I mean, there's something that's not the soul in incarnation. There's something that's the soul on its own plane. And there's something that's not the uh, uh, consciousness within the causal body. It, there's a non-local field called the spiritual triad, and there's the consciousness in that. And there's something called, eventually, the monad, or the spirit where we're identified as one with everything. So what is your point from which you observe and then reclaim and then uh, unify all uh, uh, your perceptions into one thing? So detachment is a really important word and usually we think of it as uh, the, the distinction between soul and personality and that's a good start, you know. Um, and of course, dispassion helps along with that. So I, I, if you could only see my screen, my computer has been telling me something. So um, the key with detachment, and I suppose books and books have been written about it, is both uh, not to care and to care simultaneously. 
you know, it's, it's one of those things like Alice Bailey had where you are personally impersonal and impersonally personal. That's what we learned when we started our secretarial work. This, uh, I care and I don't care. You know, the certain attitude of indifference. He says it's a great thing to cultivate, but on the other hand, I do care and I don't care. And can we contain the opposites of this? Can we contain the paradox of caring and not caring? There's this great Mahamaya. Every universe is a Mahamaya. It's going on forever and it will. And uh, it is entirely us. From a, from a deep perspective, this whole Mahamaya that we are participating in is entirely us. But apparently it's not us entirely. So, you know, <laughs> Uh, there's a wisdom in paradox, and if you can see the contradictions, uh, things will get more real, and maybe unreal at the same time. So, look, it's, it's the, the Mahamaya, which is the universe, and their uh, infinitudinous instantiations of the universe, um, it's a great veil upon what we are, and yet what we are, being indivisible, Think about that. The indivisibility of you cannot help but be entirely present at all moments in all the things from the very smallest to the largest. And that's like a great mystery. How do you put absolute infinity into Anu the speck without separating it at all? Well, you know, when you start to think in those non-personal terms, it's easier to detach and, and to look at what we thought was ourself before under a condition of mistaken identity is not ourself at all, and yet it is. So just get used to paradox, you know, and, and there's a certain logic in paradox and a certain revelation that comes with paradox. I sometimes think of reality as called the great paradox. So anyway, um, to the extent that our perceptions veil the soul, or veil the inner reality, uh, the consciousness we have and, and that we are, detachment is utterly necessary if we're to live free and above the confinement of illusion. So what do we have? Discipline, dispassion, discrimination, decentralization, detachment, the five Ds. Now DK also um, tells us in the beginning of Rule 11, which is uh, in the raise and initiation, it's a big rule, big rule about the um, fourth initiation. Uh, you know, if we as a group could master that, that rule, then we would be taking the fourth initiation together as a group, and we're certainly a very long way from being able to do that. But, you know, I'm not going to read all this, but it's wonderful. Just go there uh, into that book, and he, he talks about four destructions, four eliminations, before you can even begin to think about applying the rule. And he, first of all, he wants you to kill out desire, it's the first destructive activity of the disciple. It's not what the disciple seeks or wants or desires that should condition him and drive him to what might be called ashramic acquiescence, but the all-impelling impo motive of world need. Okay, so kill out desire, preoccupation with world need, desire dies of attrition. So. That's tough, isn't it? You know, the Buddha really concentrated on helping us kill out desire for, for the phenomenal world. On the other hand, we can't really eliminate desire because it's a cosmic principle, so we have to redirect and co-measure our desires. A big, a big task. Now, the next destruction is we have to destroy all the ties which link the personalities of the group members. Oops. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, these must be severed, and the relation between the group members must be on the basis of soul activity. Joint pledge to the master of the ashram and a united service given to humanity, and then a point of freedom will come. I'm not going to read all this, but it's very beautiful, and uh, it gives us these injunctions about destructions we must undertake. After all, the fourth degree, interesting, four destructions and the fourth degree. Here's the cross in the heart in the fourth degree, and we have to prepare it through four destructions. Now that's the Pluto-Vulcan part of discipleship, and being inherently biased 
towards the second ray and towards attachment, we don't necessarily want to do that. That's the hard part. But if we identify as something else than that which is being destroyed, which is the truth, then in fact it's easier to carry out. Here's another good one. The third quality which must be utterly rooted out and destroyed, now, you know, this is a nice second ray disciple talking, right? Um, is that of all reaction towards recognition. Whether that recognition is accorded by the world of men, by other disciples, or by the master. The ability to work without any token of recognition, to, to see, see others claim. claim the reward of action taken, and even to be unaware that the results of the good initiated by the individual disciple or his group are claimed by others, are the hallmarks of the hierarchical worker. And then he says, look, we started a lot of things, but you disciples get the credit and we don't care. Okay, so <laughs> they've mastered this and uh, it, it talks about who pays the karma, but I'll leave that out of the picture for right now. There's a fourth factor, the cultivation of silence. Apparently uh, this destructive factor has to do with speech, but it's kind of amusing, I think DK is, pretty good here in his sense of humor. Uh, how we ask ourselves at times when the functioning of the ashram is under discussion, can we train our disciples to realize that essentially silence is not refraining from speech? Interesting. So many disciples seem to think it is and that they have to learn not to talk if they hope to take initiation. I was... <laughs> I spent some time in some different groups and everyone would walk around not talking to each other, you know, because that was the spiritual thing to do. But of course, that's pretty silly. Um, some would do a great deal better, he says, if they talked more than they do along the right lines. And the silence imposed in an ashram is refraining from certain lines of thought, the elimination of reverie and the unwholesome use of the creative imagination. And so speech is stopped at its source. So those are the four eliminations that we have to go through even before we can begin to think about fulfilling Rule 11. Think about it, you know, if some of you have read the Rays and Initiations and the 14 Rules there, and some people say that Alice Bailey is passe and what the Tibetan Road was a long time ago, and come on, has anybody fulfilled those 14 Rules? It's the rules for group work in the Aquarian Age. So, you know, let's be realistic about this. So look, are we willing to do this groundwork until it really gets done. It is groundwork, uh, but we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves, be assuming that just because we've reached a certain point in our conception of our discipleship that we don't have any more of these eliminations to go through, the five Ds and these four preparatory eliminations, the four modes of destruction. It does continue, and we, we can't really leave it behind. And, uh, even planetary logo I have their task cut out before them. You know, they're not perfect. They're the imperfect gods. Even our solar god is not perfect, not like Sirius, and Sirius would look to something greater and say, not perfect. And always there have to be uh, eliminations and preparations for the next stage. So all the way up to the top, we have to monitor ourselves and get rid of things that are in the way of the next revelation. You know, we learn about the Buddha, the Tibetan tells us, where would one hear about this? But, uh, you know, through, through him, that when it came to his sixth initiation uh, and the great enlightenment, which was also the great decision, that he chose the path of earth service because of his love of humanity and his attachment to humanity, and it wasn't really his path at all. He calls it a most understandable sin. And then he relates that to the sin of the planetary logos back on the moonshine days when the planetary logos got compassionate too fast and let the beast out of the bag, you know? And we've been suffering from that for a long time. So we have to understand that this process of eliminating what has to go is not just going to go away. We're gonna stay with this for a long, long time and we have to be willing to do it. So, and a long time away, how long does the universe last? Well, no time at all, and yet a long time. Okay, contain the paradox. So when, for us at least, the obstructions are removed within the realm of the personality, and you know, later, the realm of the causal body, strange as that may seem to people like ourselves, then the next divine aspect will come pouring in, and that's going to be for us at least love and wisdom. So 
Let's all get rid of what's in the way. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.